Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I would like to welcome all of you tonight to our presentation. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a very brief announcements period. Two, we then have our speakers who will speak. There will be two of them tonight. Third, after our speaker speaks, we have a question and answer period. After the question and answer period, we then will get into our infamous rebuttal period. All right, tonight we have two speakers. The first one to uh, present tonight will be Charlie Paydock, followed by Mark Loveless, candidate for city clerk. Ideas that work to make this city better now. So first I'll have Charlie come up, give his brief presentation, and when he's done, I'll reintroduce Mark Loveless, and we're all set. Thank you. 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 Period in the political history of the city, uh, with the decision of the incumbent mayor, obviously not to seek re-election, even though he had opened the campaign office. I was at it, and uh, he was all set to go, and then rather abruptly decided, uh, apparently, not to seek re-election, which opened it up for. At the present time, uh, it was just the filing, was just the other day, and 21 candidates submitted their uh, signatures in order to gain uh, ballot access, to get on the ballot. And what I thought I would do is go through each of them uh, briefly, in no detail, and we can even open it up to talk while I'm doing this, please. Don't observe the standard protocols of the college. We have, we're not that onerous a group here tonight. But if you want to comment on any of this, uh, I certainly would welcome it. I'm not as well versed on Chicago politics as I would like to be, but I'm working on it. So I'm a bit more of a Fed guy. But anyhow, as you can see, there was quite a field of candidates uh, showed up. Uh, that's only 12 of them. But uh, they're from all walks, uh, occupations, and segments of the, the good cross-section of the city. And if you, are, like many people, are, are at this point in time completely undecided about which way they're going to go, given that's a complete list of it, uh, of all the candidates uh, have demonstrated uh, at some threshold. You could go further and extend this list forever, I guess, but there's got to be a cutoff at some point. And these were people who submitted uh, signatures to the Board of Elections. And I'm going to go each of them basically alphabetically for the most part, and we're going to take a look at each one here. Now, the first one that's been around is Dorothy Brown. And Cook County Circuit Court Clerk, and I'll just summarize that. Uh, unfortunately, it goes back to 2015, but she was under federal investigation. I believe there were two bribes. The others would know more of the details, but although she's not been charged with a crime, and has repeatedly denied wrongdoing, wrongdoing uh, claiming that the people can trust her. And she's vowing to work to make every square mile of the city world first class. So that's Dorothy Brown, uh, is somewhat of a figure in the scene. What was now, the investigation into? What? Several things. Was there there were two bribes. Uh, uh, I think one was, at least was, they did take even records from her home I think one of them I know amounted to something like $15,000. I don't know what the other one was. 
I actually was involved somewhat in a similar case in investing. I was not in the front of one, but I, I knew the parties. They were government employees. But the woman, I was amazed, there was almost the same figure. She took a bribe of $15,000. Uh, this was in another section of the government. Whenever you guys get done visiting, I will you know, continue. All right, thank you. He's taking over. Jerry Chico. Okay, he's running for mayor once again. Uh, he worked for the former mayor, Richard Daly, as chief of staff, president of Chicago schools. He's got quite experience there. Ran for Senate. Uh, later was president of the Park District. Uh, so, but he got 24% of the vote last time. 24, uh, uh, which forced a, r a runoff. But uh, he's he's back trying to his second chance at it. A new guy on the scene is a guy from my part of town. Good old 11th Ward, the Bridgeport, Bill Daly. He's, he's got really good credentials here. Probably the best of all the candidates, I, I think. <laughs> uh, well, he worked for President Obama. Uh, he was chief of staff to the President of the United States. That's a pretty good position, you know? Like, he was kind of like my boss, as a matter of fact. He was Secretary of Commerce under Clinton. So, uh, and the, um, he's following his dad and his brother, uh, who were longest, long, two longest serving mayors. How did they end up serving so long in office if they were so bad? <laughs> you know, 21 years? They were never invested. Uh, why would they keep getting reelected? I <laughs> did seven terms. Seven terms. We got a machine working. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, he's already hit the airwaves. I've seen his commercials any number of times. Uh, he's put together a viable campaign, uh, whereas others, I think, are still in the wannabe category. How much money so, does he have? You know, one point two million. The last I heard. Where did it come from? Hmm? Democratic Party. People or? that are advocates of good government, like me. I tipped, I, I went to Act Blue, as a matter of fact, Ellen, and contributed to his campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it illegal to get it from the party, anybody who's affiliated with the party? I don't know the laws regarding financial contributions. I will mm -hmm. honestly don't. So it's not allowed. You have to sign it that you don't take well, any money from the party. Well, since you don't know how you got his money, how do you know it was illegal? I've left the best of it. There's been no evidence of wrongdoing in this regard. <laughs> you have to have positive evidence of wrongdoing in order for there to be an investigation. So the <laughs> All right, the next one. There's another one down. Well, she's from Garfield Park. But um, Amara is an attorney and community activist. She's throwing her hat and she ran once before in um, 2015. She's got a doctorate in education, like who doesn't these days? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a great academic degree. Uh, I'm, I, I shouldn't say that, but anyhow. <laughs> She's a director of the Chamber of Commerce down there, and she founded a social lab. We had the other guy here who had the social lab, Tom Tresser, but hers was to educate on economic development, and, uh, and she apparently co-authored a book on municipal funding. So she is uh, running for office. Another one is Jamal Green. He's the youngest that I know. He's 22 years old, um, and he's a prominent figure in the Black Lives Matter organization. Uh, he was also involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign. <coughs> uh, 
He wants him elected school board and po police reform, um, possibly based on the fact that he was arrested at the Taste of Chicago, according to his bio, um, in which he pleaded guilty to resisting laws. But anyhow, uh, he, there's a number of candidates out there that are championing uh, their particular issues, which is good. It's good. It's good to, to get to your issue um, about this. Another young man, uh, LaShawn Ford, uh, he's actually a state rep. Um, but he uh, uh, was encouraged to run. He's a state lawmaker. Uh, he represented the, the, the West Side going on 10 years, back to 2007. Uh, he actually looks like a very young man, but he's uh, not that. Uh, he's a licensed realtor and so forth, but uh, uh, he's put his hat in ring uh, to move from the state office to the city office. So there's Mr. Ford. Uh, Jerry Joyce is an interesting fellow. He's the son of the former 19th Ward Alderman. Uh, who work closely with uh, Mayor Richard Daly. He's an attorney, um, and he's worked with the Cook County Assistant State's Attorney's Office. Uh, the only thing that's clouding this office is his dad lost a big contract uh, regarding O'Hare Airport, and there's a malicious rumor that he just wants he wants to get that that contract back or he's upset uh, with the manual for taking that that work away from the family's company. So that's Jerry Joyce. This is another guy right from this is actually my neighbor. Uh, his his brother is at least. But John is John was long story short, he's a he's a uh, he's an attorney, only 30 years old. For some reason, he decided to run for alderman. Uh, they did have a runoff, but he lost, and he was bitter about it because he went up against the Daily uh, Patrick Daly Thompson and lost, and claims that they used the machine against him. So he's coming back, and even though he lost the aldermanic race, he was going to run for mayor. And is, and from what I understand, he submitted the requisite number of signatures to be on the ballot. So, even though he lost the aldermanic race, he showed up again uh, for the mayors. I met her the other day, uh, Lori Lightfoot, a Pete diminutive woman, um, but she was the former Chicago Police Board president. Uh, she is and uh, works with this police accountability task force, um, and that seems to be her primary issue: is is law enforcement reforms. And she was a former federal prosecutor, uh, but she's uh, early and often running in the race. That's Lori Lightfoot. See, some of these candidates, to me, they have like. They have single issues. They're, they're not generals, but that's fine. I, I can appreciate that. Everyone has a specialty that brings them up in public arena. Uh, so that's it. Now the next one, we're still, uh, there's an awful lot of people going to be, that's what I mean. This is the law and order campaign of the, of the century here. Because in addition to all these other people, uh, now, You've got a, a Chicago police superintendent running. So he's, he's got the other point of view. Um, he, he was fired by Emmanuel, um, but he, he officially announced his candidacy. <coughs> uh, and he, he says he can fix the city's problems. Uh, anyhow, this is the uh, Ex-Chicago Police Superintendent is running. So we've got a lot of pros and cons and up and down and back and forth 
on law enforcement issues here. Um, he was endorsed he, by Donald Trump. You know. Uh, was he really? Yep. He didn't necessarily want the endorsement, but <laughs> Trump made it anyway. Now this is an interesting story. If I am reading this correctly, <laughs> Susanna Mendoza, just the other day, won a midterm election, as, was re-elected as the Illinois Comptroller, and I think she wasn't in office re-elected for a week. She's not even been sworn in yet. <laughs> she's running for another office, even before she's... <laughs> Get sworn in on June, yeah. January, January. Now this is a woman with a, look at her. She's, <laughs> her. she's she didn't even bother to take the job that she won. Neither did Tony. And she went, no, and Tony she's going no. for another one. This is a woman who's driven here. <laughs> and anyhow, she's a, she's a, <laughs> she's the, uh, but she is, uh, uh, she was in the state state representative for uh, 11 years. So she's been some kind of figure in, in Illinois and Chicago politics. But yeah, no sooner did she win the re-election than she said, well, maybe I'll become mayor. Uh, let's see what, what that would be. Now, long-standing picture, of course, in Chicago political scene is Hyde Parker, Tony Preckwinkle. Uh, she's been Cook County president since for about seven, eight years here. Seven, yeah, eight years. Before that, she was uh, five terms as alderman, alder person on the south side. Uh, she now she's chairing up the uh, Chicago Cook County Democratic Party which Ellen says is corrupt. <laughs> she was telling me, but I don't know about that. Anyhow, Tony Preckwinkle uh, is out there. Someone I wasn't familiar with, Neil says Griffin. There's no need to read all of this. He's an adjunct professor, meaning he's one of these people, they don't have regular teaching positions. They're, they're, they go from semester to semester at North Northwestern, he's a, a, a computer geek, an adjunct professor at Northwestern, uh, and he decided to run to get the youth vote on the basis that Ram wasn't doing a good enough job, he said. He gave an hour and a half speech uh, announcing his candidacy on the topic. He's an also young man, only but he has no, I'm sorry, I can receive no previous government experience. Paul Vallis, if education is your concern, as it is to many uh, parents in the city, the value of education, Paul Vallis, then is your candidate. Uh, he served as superintendent of schools in New Orleans and in Connecticut, Philadelphia. He ran for governor, a few things like that under uh, ran, on, ran with Pat Quinn, but he's back uh, seeking to be the mayor of the city. So, you know. All right, I don't know very much about Mr. Willie Wilson. <laughs> Dr. Wilson. <laughs> he ran for mayor the last time around, and all I know is he was giving away money or something like that. Uh, he runs uh, some McDonald's franchises. Um, the opponent said that he was buying votes, but he said he was just helping the poor people out <laughs> by giving them money, free money, you know. But uh, Willie, Dr. Willie Wilson here. Now another one, this is a new newcomer to the political arena, is Catherine Brown D. Tycoon. And she's a pastor of a church um, involved in several community organizations um, and serves on local school councils. Uh, she 
is getting some degree of notoriety because she submitted more signatures than any other candidate for the office of mayor. I think the closest was 55,000. She actually submitted 88,000 signatures. The only difficulty was they had a lot of these were just photocopies. The signatures. <laughs> well, just get one and run out of copies. You'll get 10,000. You guys didn't think of that. That's, she's got my book. <laughs> <laughs> with, a name, with a name like D Tycoon, is she a capitalist? Yeah. I, there's an explanation she gives about that. Uh, okay, but once again, Bob, if you're ready, is uh, running again. Um, is two-term board alderman. Um, but uh, no, no, there's known within the city for his views already. A newcomer, uh, she, we couldn't find a photo of her, Kareen Hikes Clark. This is an interesting story. Actually, her campaign started right around by my house. She got off the bus, and then she saw a guy collecting signatures, might even have been me, and said, what are you doing? And I said, we're collecting signatures to run a candidate for mayor. And then she looked at it and said, you know, got interested. And as a result of that, she went home and then got her own petitions and decided to run herself. She has no specific qualifications. <coughs> she does volunteer at her local uh, is she element. Is on the ballot with that? Element. Well, the thing is, well, Ellen. Someone has to challenge it. Right? She only. She only got 63 signatures. Yeah, oh, 53. So, but she said, you know, uh, you gotta learn. She said, you gotta learn. It's like anything else. You gotta learn. Yeah. So she's learning. There's so. something wrong with that, right? Nothing right. wrong with learning. You know? But <laughs> she actually, I was thinking about this. She actually had to go home and then take some effort to go out. But yeah, she. Uh, who knows? Another one we couldn't find out um, is Roger Washington is a rather interesting candidate. Uh, he, he's a police officer, um, but he's concerned about crime, which I am. I like this guy. He wants to bring it in to crime, although he's been charged with 16 misconduct violations. <laughs> 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 Which he says won't be held against them. That won't be a barrier to building trust with the community. The fact that he's had some brought up some charges for misconduct. Um, but he he's a police officer and a pastor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but he has to want to do some things on real estate. He's particularly concerned. I like the other thing, the, I didn't, now this I didn't understand if he's a cop, he couldn't fix tickets, but he said that at the very end it says largely due to honor city ticket, city ticket debt dragged up by his family members who drove cars registered in his name, he had a declare bankruptcy. I guess they got so many parking tickets. Thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> but perhaps I'll do something about that. Oh, Sandra Mallory. Um, she's got a nice website. She did file 15,000 signatures. And uh, she basically is, just, as I said, a single issue candidate. And her issue is homelessness. It's the only thing she really discusses. She's a social worker. Um, and. Uh, the, the, but basically, she wants to bring it in there, as you can see, to homelessness in the city. And Richard Myers, we're almost done. Uh, Richard Myers, I know about. He actually ran for the Green Party 
in this the fifth district last time around, and the Green Party challenged it and got him bumped off the ballot, but he showed up again. He filed simultaneously to run. Now this guy is creative. Simultaneously to run for mayor, treasurer, clerk, and alderman at the same time. Hey, what money? <laughs> Hey, we could save all that money. <laughs> That's good. He could be mayor, treasurer. He's got my vote. Anyhow, uh, he has some other things. He wants to put toll booths on Lakeshore Drive. But as I say, he was kicked off. He was trying to run as a Green without notifying the Green Party. And they said, no, I'm sorry. That's not the way we do things. He was just uh, doing it. Okay, and that's the all. I just want to thank you, but you vote, be sure to vote to get things done for Chicago. Uh, and there you go. Thank you very much. Vote for Charlie, who is the projected winner. Uh, yeah. We all win when we vote. <laughs> now I hope you're an educated voter. Mayor <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> oh, Lord. I like that guy. He's running for all them offices. <laughs> <laughs> He's got my vote. Yeah, we don't need it, do we? Now to introduce our second speaker, Mark Loveless, candidate for city clerk. Ideas that work to make the city better now. His platform is reform city vehicle stickers, programs and other fees, provide quality of life report on no, all the ordinances, um, social enterprise and civic investment initiative, empower social entrepreneurship and fertilize mission-driven venues, promote civic engagement, social justice and civil liberties, promote accountability of fees and reduce penalties to improve the quality of life. Let's give a warm round of applause to Mr. Mark Loveless. I have to uh, begin by saying, well, first, let me say, I, I want to thank you all for inviting me to come back here again. Uh, I also need to clarify, uh, I was running for city clerk. I did not turn in the petitions. Uh, basically, uh, I have some uh, medical issues that I've got to attend to, and uh, once and I couldn't get it resolved. I tried everything to negotiate. I was on the, I had the petitions, and I was uh, on, on, on the Monday they were due, and I'm trying to negotiate with my doctor. I said, so, okay, so what if I do this and this and this, and then we won't have to have an operation? And he says, uh, no, 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 you have to do all those things, but we're going to operate. So, so I didn't no. think that it would be uh, actually appropriate to, um, get out in the race and uh, had to run and not be able to give my uh, full attention to the race uh, knowing knowing what I you know what I knew so um, but uh, just to assure people I'm, I'm okay <laughs> uh, I, I had someone call me yesterday and said because I was I had commemorated uh, the fifth this is the fifth year since my oldest son, uh, Nathan passed away, and I said uh, somehow I, I said I'll see you, uh, see you soon uh, to him, oh and someone thought that it meant that I was in really bad shape. I says no, I, I say that because I when I go to church I do see him. I, you know, I, when I'm praying I do see him. So, uh, but anyway, um, I wanna uh, so I'm not actually running for uh, uh, clerk. Although, I don't know, the way things are going, uh, if I can get in the hospital, I, I go in on the 19th. If I get out and everything's going fine, the way these challenges and things are looking, I may end up running any, anyway if there's no other candidates on the ballot. Uh, I think that one of the things that, uh, 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 through Charlie's presentation, one, uh, he was talking about people getting on the ballot and staying on the ballot. and. Uh, that's that's a definite challenge that we that uh, is staying on the ballot. Uh, I just found out today. Oh, by the way, uh, breaking news: the the IBI IPO did their citywide endorsement session today. 
Um, and uh, as a result, they ended up deciding to make no endorsement in mayor and the mayor's race, and no endorsement in the clerk's race, and they endorsed Peter Greppi for for treasurer. And um, okay, that, that that's how that went. Just so that you know, uh, the other during that conference during that discussion. A couple of things came up regarding the other candidates that are running for mayor, and um, I, I guess there's it's a real question if if uh, Dorothy and Susanna are going to be able to stay on the ballot. Uh, there, there. Uh, I think that so far, I think it's uh, Dorothy has like seven. Dorothy Brown Cook, and it, her her name she's running under her full name, so it's not Dorothy Brown, it's going to be Dorothy Brown Cook. And um, so she's, uh, doesn't, she may not be able to, to be sustained on the ballot. Um, as Susanna Mendoza, and then the clerk candidates in the race I was entering in, one candidate has been cited for, I guess the copying of petitions is, is, is a new thing or is a current thing because uh, there's another uh, Latino female candidate, her name is Betty something, and she's like, I guess, turned in a lot, but a lot of them were copies uh, of the original sheet. So the, so, uh, the, the objection is that she doesn't have enough to get on the ballot. The other candidate, well, there, there's your friend who, who who filed for all three races, so I don't think he's going to stay on the ballot. And uh, there's another candidate, uh, Pat Horton, who I believe the issue was around statement of economic interest or whether it was filed. So she, uh, so uh, uh, that's a that's called a fatal flaw. And then the actual clerk has an issue with her name. Uh, and there's been a, a challenge uh, to her petitions. Um, apparently, uh, we know her as, as Anna Valencia, but I guess her given name was Andrea or something like that. I don't know. But they're saying that because she's not registered and filed under her, her actual name, that that's a point of being, of, of, of challenge, of, to challenge her. So I think that's, so, you know, we may end up with no candidates for Clark. <laughs> so, and, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but when I launched the campaign uh, and started, and I, and I did, you know, we ended up gathering 20,000 signatures, and I really crisscrossed the, uh, the city uh, in the race. That I learned a lot of what the issues are with other people. I floated my ideas out there and got a lot of support uh, in regards to that. Um, the, the whole theme of ideas, ideas that work, or, or good ideas for the city, that was, that's act, that was actually the campaign theme that uh, we had taken, uh, basically coming from my uh, perspective as social entrepreneur and uh, as well as a, you know, as a commissioner on the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation, uh, which is, uh, Ellen had asked me about it, and uh, you can all, our, if you go to Cook County Commission on Social Innovation, we have both our one year, our first year, and our second year uh, report uh, to the community and, uh, as to the things that we've been involved with and what we've been able to accomplish. We have, uh, but uh, back directly to the city, I think we have a, uh, we have a very interesting situation here. And, and a situation where uh, I, I, I know that we know we're going to have a new mayor. Uh, we'll, we'll have an elected clerk and an appointed clerk, and, and uh, we'll have a new treasurer. But even more than that, uh, I think all but three of the 50, I think it's three or four of the 50 uh, aldermen are being challenged. So I, I, I know Scott Wegesback is not challenged. And I know uh, Brendan Riley's not challenged. Uh, I can't think of who, who else. 
but there's a healthy variety of, of, of innovative candidates that are running um, that, that, are, that are running for aldermen in various wards. Uh, it, even in, and, and some of them are in places where you wouldn't where, where you wouldn't suspect. Uh, I, I believe there are, if I'm not mistaken, three candidates, socialist candidates, uh, members of the Democratic Socialists of America, who are no, 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 no. I mean, in one ward, in the 40th ward, in the 40th ward, I believe there are three, and uh, all longtime residents. We've got. Uh, of course, the leading uh, Democratic Socialist elected official in this city is Carlos uh, Ramirez Rosa, and he's being challenged by <laughs> someone who says, I'm just like Carlos, but I'm just not a socialist. Okay, what does, how could you be just like Carlos and not a socialist? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> All we want, all we huh? What? I bet somebody's backing him. You know, the Democratic Party. Yeah. Well, that. there, there, are, actually, there. Are, I, I think there are two. There are two people challenging. Uh, that, that are challenging Carlos, uh, which I really hope that, that he's able to pull it all off. Uh, I'll do everything I can to support him. Uh, and then there are other socialist candidates that are running. Uh, uh, primarily in, the, in, in this area, uh, uh, the northwest side of the city, uh, we've got some good candidates th who are running, uh, as well as in uh, Little Little Village, Pilsen, a little village. There, we've got. I think there are two, there are there are three candidates, and two of them are are, are socialists. So there's going to be a different. Uh, um, and I point that out only because, you know, I'm, I'm a democratic socialist and I've been for a while. I'm really excited about how the uh, philosophy and, I, and ideology is, is, is finally catching ground. I really think Chicago's structure of government is one of the most, uh, the structure as it's, as it's established and intended is probably one of the most progressive city models of government uh, that you can find. Uh, the idea of a strong, of a, a strong council and weak mayor. If that, if we get to that point, I think we're actually going to get to that point this time. And we're going to see what the uh, how the rest of the uh, uh, body and how governing turns out uh, uh, turns up. Um, but I think that there are some things that we can. So I think this is a time for us to ask for to the, of the elected officials everything we want to do, everything we want to see. So uh, one of the things that I wanted, to, uh, that uh, I think is, is essential, if you recall four years ago when I was talking about this position and I came to speak to you, I was talking about the uh, city sticker and how I really thought that the city vehicle sticker tax was uh, an unnecessary burden. Uh, there's no practicality to it. We can't figure out where the money's going. And we are the, of, of the top 16 largest cities in America, we are the only city that has a vehicle sticker tax. Uh, and, and 100 years ago, it made sense to have a vehicle sticker tax because uh, that's what paid for roads. But we know now, uh, and living in this, in this age and in this time, uh, is that there are so many other options that take care of roads that it doesn't it doesn't make sense. The, the city sticker, I think, generates something like one eighteenth or one sixteenth of what the of what's designated to roads in the city of Chicago. We really don't know where the money goes, and no one really can uh, address where the money goes. Now, the current clerk, who was appointed by Rahm Emanuel, has proposed that. Um, has proposed it has has a new pr uh, process called a uh, it's it's a three month city sticker instead of a a, a one year st city sticker and it's like thirty dollars that you pay and then uh, for three months and then thir and then uh, you can pay another thirty dollars for another three or four months to me that's not and she's and uh, she's doing this under 
the guise of um, of trying to make the this, this, this sticker more affordable without any recollection or, or understanding that anything to make the sticker more affordable is the same thinking of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's a bad idea. It needs to go down and people need, you know, the only benefit ought to be repealed. Not how do you pay, not how do you reduce this cost. How about just repeal it? The, uh, no other city, to, uh, uh, as I said, remember the top 16 cities were the only one that doesn't. But anybody running for executive office, I think, has got to uh, has got to bring forth uh, issues around revenue, around uh, generation of revenue, and I think the conversation instead of just around revenue needs to be around uh, rational revenue. What are what are, what are rational things that we could do? to generate income. So the mayor had this big old speech that he gave. I really don't understand what the point of it was this past week where he came out and said he was in favor of, of uh, marijuana as, as uh, recreational, legalized recreational marijuana. And he called for, um, he called for there to be a, uh, a, a casino a city-owned casino. Uh, now, the, the only issue, I think if we look at our, at other places around the country where they have had uh, casino gaming, uh, gaming has been going down as far as the industry. It, it, it's, it's not been, not only has it not been the panacea that it was first thought to be, it's just not necessarily the wisest investment of 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 uh, of recruitment, of of, of uh, dollars or tourists or anything like that. So um, the other the other item is is the recreational marijuana, which is every everyone's jumping on recreational marijuana, and, that, and it's a it's a great thing. However, I think that's only part of the problem because once you it's not just uh, it's not just legalizing recreational marijuana. But we're going to also need to do something about the people who have been arrested and who have records in regards to, you know, marijuana. You know, and so if we're not talking about a reform that that encompasses and that expunges those records and frees those people from that conviction, if that's their primary interest, then we're not really talking about addressing the core and the actual and the actual causes. Now, one of the mayoral candidates had mentioned, uh, as you, you probably heard, is uh, I think it's I think it was Bill Daly that mentioned the commuter tax, I believe. Uh, well, whoever suggested the commuter tax, I honestly think that that's a good idea. I think that's something we need to entertain, because what happens is you have we, there are millions of people. There are about. There are like a million people that commute into the city every day and they make you know millions of dollars and then they leave the city and say, oh, isn't that place a mess? You know, it's sort of like going to a party and then you leave the party and say, oh, that place was awful, wasn't it? You, you've been at the party. You, you know, you know, you're not going to help move a dish. You're not going to, you know. So uh, with, that, with that said, I think that, that it is that it is rational to talk about uh, a commuter tax, but the issue is who pays for it? Do you shove it onto the actual workers, or do you call upon the corporations, or do, or do you call upon the corporations that uh, are also profiting to be responsible regarding commuters who are, are employees who are outside of the city coming into the city? Uh, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, the, one of the things that, the last thing that the, that the uh, current mayor has brought forth as an as a idea is uh, reducing the, or being able to adjust the pension uh, payouts as a, as a resolution to uh, city problems. Um, as the son of uh, one of the organizers of AFSCME in Detroit, 
I can tell you that is a ludicrous idea. Uh, those uh, the, the city workers came, worked for the city. There was a promise made. They made their contribution. And if because of Ed Burke or whoever else, they did not live up to those obligations, that is not now the problem of the people who have given their lives and careers and various positions in the city. So I hope we don't get to that. Um, so in conclusion, because uh, I'm getting the, the rap sign, and I know, I think I went all, all over to, uh, is that okay? No, <laughs> just, no, no, in conclusion, the last thing that uh, I would say, and if you want to ask me questions about the commission, I can, I can talk about the types of things that we've done and, and, and why we're doing it, why we're uh, excited about the work that we do at the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. But at, at the final conclusion, I think that people have, uh, have interesting choices and they, and, and they ought to take realistic uh, uh, observation. Um, the fact that IBI could not come to a conclusion is pretty sad that they didn't make a decision as far as mayor. Uh, they were like, well, we'll wait till after the primary. You know, to me, I, th I, I think that those are the elections when people these are the types of elections where people really need guidance and direction and not fall prey to just actual political convenience. So uh, I, I don't necessarily think that was the best thing. But I, I hope that people, as, as uh, Charlie said, be, uh, are contemplative voters of, of vote your interest. And if we all vote our interest because we're all good people, I believe we'll end up with the city government and a city administration that will be uniquely uh, prepared to serve us all. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. We got uh, questions, Charlie, and uh, if you're ready to go up and take oh, them. So, so you stay there. Yeah. No, it's just this is question time now. Right. We'll take yeah. about. I'll answer anything you want to ask me. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah, I got yeah. questions. Um, this is, I've got a couple of few questions, but um, Just one is, who are you going to vote for? Who is your preferred candidate? For and why? You know, I, for mayor, uh, alderman, you know, I mean, you say the independent yeah. commission didn't, couldn't choose one, but uh, I, I guess how, how have you made your choice? And, uh, well, uh, you, you want to answer, Charlie? Yeah, I go for Bill Daly. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Why? Why? Fellow co federal co worker? Same, same unit I was in. He's a co worker. He's a I don't, a co worker of mine. I don't agree with Charlie here. I'll, I'll be honest, I have seen just about all of these candidates and and the, the candidates that the candidates that, that stand out for me are uh, I would say would be uh, Lori Lightfoot and LaShawn Ford. I mean LaShawn would have ran for mayor four years ago if there wasn't uh, if, if there wasn't these uh, untrue allegations against him that were levied and, and eventually dismissed. Uh, and I think that he would he would be a good choice. Um, I'm thinking of the other of of, of who else. I you know I, I I can't get over the fact that um, Amara is being supported by uh, Kanye West, and I don't. And I think there has to be some a clearer explanation about that, which hasn't happened. Um, and the other candidates, like I say, I don't know who's going to, you know, who, who eventually will, will make yeah. will be on the ballot. Yeah, I'm going to try to leave. But, you know, they only made $13 it's a learning process. Why? Wow. Who are you thinking about? I was, I, I really, you know, I thought of Tony, but I thought about Tony Gonzalez, but I thought about Tony Gonzalez, but I thought about Concerned about Lori Lightfoot, and I, all of them I worry about. I think Tony, frankly, I don't know much about her, and I, I didn't know much about LaShawn Ford, so that that's interesting. Um, but just in terms of Tony, Lori Lightfoot, um, you know, I watched her not really seem to 
care about the number of wrongfully convicted, imprisoned people. You know, she was in a position to do something, and people give her credit as if she did care, but she seemed to be kind of a an authoritarian, I think, you know, and um, I think that's my concern that all of them are, are part of the same system, you know, so there, who's going to be independent? There are 11 black candidates, African-American candidates. I think there's four Hispanic, and they're going to pick off each other, which leaves a clear path for Bill. And, and uh, or or uh, what I actually heard is uh, the police officers are thinking that Gary McCarthy is their best choice. No, that's just that's I'm not enough for one. But I, you know, and uh, for what they, for protecting they, the wall of silence? These are like <laughs> not well, changing anything. Yeah, this, the CTA employees are going to run their their their. They're union guys <laughs> the mayor. I, I don't know if those are real campaigns, though. Well, I, I, let, let me say this also. The, the, one of the reasons why I uh, side with Lori, uh, or that comes to mind, the two reasons. One, uh, I'm the chair of the Southside Democracy for America, and that group endorsed her. So I'm, so, I'm sort of sticking with this endorsement. But the other thing is when she was head of the police board and they set up those citizen review, the, uh, they set up citizen review uh, panels and task force, there were a couple, and I know I was, I, I was invited to participate and give suggestions to that. So as somebody who's, I, I've seen her sincerity in regards to reform and the fact that even though when she was on the police board, she was she was not necessarily a just go along to get along person there. And I do remember her having some pointed comments with the city and with the superintendent at the time. So uh, that that's the only thing that that's that's what guided my uh, in there. What do you think of Tony Craigwin? All right. What's your concern about her? I mean, she's been around. She's a known person. Is there issues or? Yeah, she's actually uh, the committee man in the ward that I live in, and I think she's. The, um, I I will. I'm worried that they're going to that they the media is going to have a field day after the first of the year regarding her employees and uh, that it's sort of percolating. I don't, I, I don't know where it's going to go, uh, uh, but um, I don't know how they're going to, I'm sort of concerned as to what, what's going to happen with that, you know, and how, because I think they're going to beat the, beat the hell out of her over it. Okay. The, uh, someone convinced Crackwinkle that the Cook County Board and the President could control or take over and fix public transit in Chicago and Cook County, which the Cook County Board has a very little function of providing taxation, which they vote on once a year. It's not, it's by law and statute. I don't even think they vote on it each year, but they do approve the budget, but they have absolutely nothing to do with transit. Anyhow, this person already convinced her that she could take over public transit and operate the three systems and be a reformer and so forth. And Perk Ringo gave this talk and she said, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm looking into taking over public transit. I knew about this. So when it was over, uh, they had the question and answer period. I asked her about uh, transit fare for free seniors and reduced riders. She says, well, I don't have anything to do with transit. All right. She denied it. Okay. I got all that will have still. Okay. I mean, it's hard to speak. All right. Well, I have um, very little input on transit. 
I know we're kind of running a little short on time tonight. Does anybody else have a question who hasn't asked a question? All right, let's go to rebuttals. Can I get a hand on how many want rebuttals tonight? How about a hand for a speaker? Yeah. All right. We'll do five. It sounded like you knew what you were talking. We'll do five. We'll do five minutes each for rebuttals. Do I get to rebuttal myself? Uh, yeah. You want to go up there, Dave, and uh, give the first you one? Yeah. That's the best second. Got about five. We'll, we'll go five to six minutes because there's not a lot here tonight. All right, uh, with regard to one comment that was made before, um, I heard some people criticize Susana Mendoza for turning around and running for, for mayor right after she was elected controller. And I've heard the same criticism of Tony Franklin. And my answer to that is this. First of all, let me explain that I am an old-time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. And as the elder Mayor Daly once said, we Democrats have nothing to apologize for. That's number one. Number two, when Chairman Daly, as he was then, was safely reelected as clerk of Cook County in 1954, all during the campaign for clerk, people were asking him, well, Mr. Chairman, are you going to run for mayor in next year's primary against Martin Canelli, the incumbent mayor? And Chairman Daly hemmed and hawed and never really gave, never really gave a straight answer. When O'Connor, one of the city's premier news, news people and the longtime analyst for Channel 5, even asked him that question. And Chairman Daly goes, well then, that's loaded as problematical and loaded as you know. Well, no sooner was he reelected than he announced his candidacy for the Democratic nomination for mayor. My attitude is, if it's good enough for Mayor Daly, it's good enough for Susana Mendoza and Tony Preckwinkle. Thank you. Okay, our next rebutter, please. Isn't there anybody else rebutting tonight? Yeah, I guess. I guess so. Come on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we need to... Uh, yeah. So, hi. Yeah, I'm Ellen Corley. Um, I was, uh, as I've said before, uh, I love the, this free speech forum. Um, I am interested in running myself for, for mayor. You know, um, I wouldn't have said that five years ago, um, but I couldn't get the signatures. I, it, it's interesting. Um, I really think we, what we need for innovation and reform is uh, party, uh, maybe the democratic socialist is the one I should go to that will develop candidates. You know, I, I got involved with Obama's Organizing for Action four years ago, I guess, and um, I, they didn't help much. We worked on gun violence, which is what led me to becoming more of an organizer. But, and, and the more I focused on organizing, uh, what are the real issues, what are the coalitions, I, you know, identified the concern about police crime and police misconduct and corruption that goes with impunity and I, I see the system is not going to change especially from below uh, you know there's you can protest and beg that they let your son out of jail for something he didn't do but uh, it's very hard to do I mean it it's we're starting to make a little movement but it'd be real easy if you had a real honest independent compassionate uh, leader at the top um, in a position because one thing I notice is either you're elected or you're appointed but and I think both of them are kind of bad especially once I tried getting those signatures and the, see how it works that I was out there I pushed off out of the jewel pushed out of the subways pushed out of the because of jerry rigging I could only really get enough signatures at the last minute at a couple of jewels and I wasn't allowed to be there and it, it really feels like the incumbent it's kind of like Hobbs you know that the state power does not want any competition it's it's a monopoly a political monopoly is what we have and they uh, they really don't want a new person especially in 
whistleblower activist type. Uh, I, you know, and you, you notice even Carlos Ramirez Rosa has been the only one that backed our, our uh, Civilian Police Accountability Council, you know, which is just simply asking for investigation of police crime because a billion dollars has been spent on police crime. Half of it's going to the dirty lawyers protecting the dirty cops and the other half is paying off the family so they don't say anything. You know, it's, uh, you know, the problem's huge and it's suppressed and buried. And um, that's the only reason I really was like, I gotta run just to try to get in the debates. They go, we don't have debates. You know, <laughs> it's like, what? And what's another obvious sign of corruption, I'm, I'm basically a statistical analyst, intelligence analyst, and you can kind of look at it and see the way it works. They, uh, it's interesting with, with the signature process, I'm trying to help this girl, uh, this woman from the 26th Ward uh, withstand the opposition and really the incumbent pays for the opposition to dispute her. And one of the ways they do it is by running this other candidate with the money. But, and this girl turns in 5,000 signatures and I went through 60 of them, they were all bad. Just, you know, she's just all in her own handwriting. But, but who's gonna go through the 5,000 to prove it? You know, she only needed 470, but you know, and they're spending all of this with the, to help the other one who doesn't have any money. And, and meanwhile, Maldonado, nobody challenged him. And I think that's the way I see all these candidates are basically running unopposed. And it, it's, and when I saw Walter Burnett was the one person who went against CPAC in our talks, after I talked to him, I said, you know, I'm your, in your ward and I, you know, running and, he goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like, well, I knew when Rahm Emanuel was there what he was going to do. He's going to do what Rahm Emanuel told him to do because Rahm Emanuel gave him the money. He's the chair of the Democratic Party and where all the money's funneled through, for the, through the NRA and, and all the FOP and really the, I mean, we have a picture of the CPAC. It's just the, the mayor's fingers running this little operation because the mayor appoints the police board and then, you know, you find one dirty cop, well, let's just move them over, but put another one. I mean, it's just come out now that uh, I saw an article that our current police chief, you know, there, you know, these articles, he was right there. He was there during Laquan McDonald, you know, killing, right? You know, covering it up. He, he's been overseeing, put Jason Van Dyke in a position. I mean, these guys are, it's like the mafia, really. There's no difference between the organizational structure of this city and the mafia. It, it's, um, you know, it's, it keeps silent. You better not say anything. You'll probably get killed. Don't challenge them. Don't say anything. And, uh, you know, people go, it's always been like that. What's so, what's so wrong with that? Well, uh, I, I don't know. It really is scary. Try, everybody should try to run. It really is very eye-opening to, you know, imagine... Say you had a kid who wants to run. I know Jimmy Carter's kid, you know, was very effective at uh, taking that video of Mitt Romney and exposing the callous thinking there. And um, I think he was, he was, something bad happened to him later. I'm not sure he's still alive, but he didn't last long, you know. And people, anybody that I know uh, who, from, you know, spending a lot of time around the South Side and the people who've been messed around with the system, they, um, they say, you you know, they'll threaten your family, all the same things. I got, I asked a question when I was at the Laquan McDonald hearing, and they, the police said, get off my floor, I'll have you arrested. I, you know, to be, I, I got, they were going to arrest me. I was in there trying to just read my work, and they, they were like, you got to get out here. It, it's game banging type. They, they pit people against each other deliberately, like you said, the, so, right. Um, right, the whites and the Hispanics uh, against each other. It's kind of sad. I've worked for three years against with the Chicago Alliance against racist political oppression, and it's like, well, will you help me? You know, get signatures or uh, you know, give me a little encouragement or something. We don't get into politics, but uh, you know, they. Um, so it, it it ends up within that group. There's about 
four or five communists and they don't get along. I mean, they really been very effective at dividing and conquering us as a country. And if there is a, a way to save the world, like the planet, like Andy talks about, um, it's very hard to get, uh, you know, to get agreement. You know, I, I got an MBA in business and a master's in education. And one thing I know with that you need to, a CEO has to run it like a, like a leader and a team. And um, I think the way it is there, you know, it's all just pit this side against that side, make it all about the money. And uh, it's, I, you know, it, it's very sad with the education. I've got to say, uh, you know, just because Dallas was a teacher, I, each one of those is just part of the same machine. But Dallas, uh, he, you know, privatizing, I was raised by, uh, you know, the stepfather was basically, you know, the same elites that are running the, the you know, New World Order. And um, they spent a lot of money privatizing this thing. And I didn't see the problem, really. Okay, you know, maybe I'd get a job. But you have to look at it really in a very cynical way that this privatization is, uh, it's, it's really like a fascist system that uh, is designed to strip all the resources out of our city and, and the money, turn it in, give it to Goldman Sachs, which I know I went to Carol Washington to be a certified drug and alcohol counselor. They've closed that now. It's only for accounting with Goldman Sachs on the top. I mean, it's really, look at that. Harold Washington, Sorry, you know, was, I, I now know was a very progressive and uh, potentially great guy. And uh, he's probably murdered, you know, and never investigated. And, um, okay, we need, we need to engage now because the planet really is at risk. Go ahead, Sid. Uh, the latest uh, information about the economy, they tell you it's about 3% unemployment. But what they don't tell you is about 40 million people have stopped looking for work. And if you stop looking for work, they don't count you no more. There's some statistics that just came out. Maybe it's been out for a while, but it hasn't uh, been told to the public yet. But the, uh, the debt of the students in the United States is $1.6 trillion. And you know what it is for uh, civilians? There are people, consumers, $4.9 trillion dollars. So you have about five and a half trillion dollars in debt in the United States. And the, if you look at the stock market going up and down, up and down, it's very, very insecure. And I was listening to the radio the other day and the guru, the economic guru from the, from the Clinton administration, Alan Greenspan says what's happening now, you, you're getting flag inflation. Flags. Stagflation. Yeah, stagflation. So what does that really mean? I mean, essentially, that the economy isn't growing at all, and you're getting inflation at the same time. So what is this amounting to, actually? You're going into a, the, not a recession, but it, I believe into a, re, into a depression. At one time, they used to call them panics. But then they modified that word because it scared people too much. Then they start calling it uh, depression. And after that, that sort of done the same thing because of 1929 depression, and now they call it a recession. So what's actually happening is a big depression. And for instance, all these people that used to get food stamps at one time, like my mother-in-law comes from South America, from Peru, and she used to get food stamps, 
and this was a number of years ago, and they've cut down quite a bit on the food stamps. So the social safety net has been shredded to a large degree. And then under Clinton, what happened, he said, we're going to end welfare as we know it and kicked off so many people from welfare that, that a lot of people's safety net has been shredded and now you get maybe 20% of what you used to get. So what, what is this actually adding up to? There's no safety net no more and if the economy goes down, it'll go way down. And then you have the profits from, the, from these big corporations, and there's three different uh, in the individuals that own half the wealth of the planet. They, Gates and, uh, what's the name, from Amazon, Bezos. Bezos. And there's another one. Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett, those three people. And like in physics, Let's say you have an action, and the action will bring on a reaction that, that uh, more or less corresponds to the action. So in the economics, it's the same way. If you cut all these programs and everything else, the, the depression or the panic will be a lot worse. And we're, we're coming to a point, I believe, where the depression that we're going to have is going to be far worse than in 1929. And what that comes out to is sort of helpful in some ways. What I mean by that is, for instance, if you have such a great depression, people will stop um, driving their cars, people won't go on airplane trips, so fossil fuel usage will be way down. So it will help that. It will help the global warming, but it will also do, I believe, and a lot of people are going in that direction towards socialism, like what can happen in France the, the, last, the last few weeks. These yellow, yellow jackets have come out because the economy is so bad there that Macron is trying to make it better for the people on the top. And, and in France, the people on the top, people on the bottom know about people on the top. They're very anti-bourgeois. And that's why they're having all these demonstrations. And it's not coming from a party or anything. It's, it's sort of like a natural reaction to what's happening there. And the same thing will happen in the United States and in other capitalist countries. So I believe they're going in the direction of a real Great Depression, and what that'll do essentially is uh, more or less raise people's consciousness to a large degree to see that the system actually isn't working. Now, some people are laughing right now, and, there's, and they don't think that something like that's going to happen, but the people that have it good to some degree they have some money to some degree, and they're doing good. What they do is more or less look out into the, into the public and say, oh, everybody is like that. Everybody's doing fairly good, and therefore, we don't have to have much change. We can keep the same system as we have now, but if we keep the same system as we have now, what will happen, you won't have a planet to live on. That's what capitalism is. It, it, it doesn't look at the, at the objective situation, but it looks at its own situation. They're making a lot of money. They don't care. And they figure a depression comes, okay. what they'll do is buy up a lot of factories and make more money than before. But that's not the way you're going to work out. You have to look at things objectively and not subjectively. Mm -hmm. You guys are a couple of real cheerful Christmas people. <laughs> <laughs> you got to understand. Socialism and communism don't yeah. work. Propaganda. Russia <laughs> went to capitalism. <laughs> China has got a capitalist system. Now, in effect, even though it's state controlled, 
we've seen a lot more people come out of abject poverty over the last 40 years. We have seen a change in our economy that has gone to bring much more people up to a higher standard of living. The point of the matter is, Sid, I think you're dead wrong. <laughs> I really think you're dead wrong. You're dead because wrong. the one thing that you've got to understand is that capitalism produces wealth. Now, we've been here before. What is it called? Under the Roosevelt administration, antitrust measures to bring back in competition. And you know what the funny thing about it, Sid, is? It worked. The breakup of Standard Oil, the breakup of a lot of monopolies and trusts. Of course you're going to have trouble when you have monopolies and trusts. Some of these big companies need to be broken up, and that's been done by what they call antitrust actions. Now, the, thing of the, point, the point of the matter is that they better start doing so soon. We've been here in history before. And even when there was such starvation wages back at the beginning of the century, there was something called a union that came in and got them. Well, I think right now our unions have been largely ineffective in organizing. I don't think that uh, if you really want radical change, why not introduce some competition into the system, get a little bit more gumption to get back to work, um, I think we've got it really good here, and the thing is, the solution does not lie in government. The solution lies in, in private initiative, in getting jobs through, through the things. And the point of the matter is, we've had more innovation in the last 30 years, just with the development of the Internet itself. I mean, my God, I can go buy a book for six and a half dollars, have it shipped to me off of eBay. And I mean, and 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 how much do they pay that guy in that Amazon factory? It's not a, it, It's Charlie. Nothing. It was a charity that I bought it from, <laughs> and it was a place that helped support youth unemployment. It was used library books, so they had no costs in the thing. They had the shipping, and the three dollars helped yeah. it. But anyway, it to me, it's amazing how. Much you forget that our capitalist and free trade system has really benefited mankind. I'm sorry, guys, but I just don't buy the argument that we're going into another major depression. We may have a recession, but we're still going to have enough jobs. We're still going to have enough things. And yes, there are solutions that will solve the planetary global warming problem. What you need is a cheap source of energy. And my God, the only way I can see that is through some form of Save for nuclear power. You know I have arguments on thorium. I've talk, talked about it many times in the past. But socialism and, and, and the corrupt government, you know, it's been around for a long time. If it's not going to be that, it's going to be something else. Human nature is somewhat corrupt, and the only way you're really going to do that is to get into your democracy, get out there and vote, run for office. Yes, it may be rigged, but you persist and you do more. Thank you. That's easy, yeah. That's, that's easy to do, yeah. Just quit my job and run for office. All right, our speakers, is there anybody else needing to rebut? And let's get into closing remarks from both of our speakers. Let's get this guy up here. All right. <laughs> All right, make sure the microphone. i got to think about this. You dropped something there. I did. What's that? Lost. And I owe you? No, it's a business card of a pastor that I need to talk to. Um, I, don't, I don't talk to people. Who wonder why I that's, that's why I need to talk to A couple of things I wanted to uh, quickly respond to before. Uh, one thing, much of the chaos that's going on uh, with the petitions and things of that nature that regarding challenging uh, candidates <coughs> in this election cycle, I really blame Jesse White because we we adopted uh, it was we were the first one you know broke clock is right uh, twice so the one time Rauner was right was when he signed automatic voter registration if. That law, which was signed by the governor, had gone into effect, and Jesse White would have done what was expected of him to do, then 
most of these challenges would not exist because we would all be registered to vote. And it's, it would be an opt-out option. Like if you didn't want to register, you would have to dis distinguish, distinguish yourself and say, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be registered to vote. But the very fact that we don't have the uh, the implementation of the law that passed the legislature and that was uh, signed by the governor uh, has it, it rests solely with Jesse White, which is why there is a pending lawsuit being uh, lodged against him for not implementing the, uh, voter, the automatic voter registration. Another thing I wanted to say, before, uh, I have to give the College of Complexes a compliment. Uh, four years ago when I was running, I, I presented the situation regarding the dog parks. The fact that in Chicago, the city of Chicago does not have any uh, dog-friendly parks that are, south, uh, that are uh, further south than uh, 16th Street. And someone uh, from the college here asked me, says, well, why do you think that is? And I says, I don't know, uh, but it's something that should be worked on. And then the person said, do you think it's race-based? And I said, hmm, I wouldn't say that, <laughs> but others might come to that conclusion. Well, I'm glad to report to you that uh, since that time, I got together with my neighbors and, and, and the aldermen in our areas, uh, and we broke ground on the on uh, the first dog parks that are they'll be like at 29th in Michigan. Is that right? Yeah, 20. Uh, uh, 39th in Michigan. 39th in Indiana. I'm sorry. And then over at Mandrake Park, uh, on that's like uh, 40 uh, 40th and uh, 40th and uh, uh, Cottage Grove area. So it's the first dog parks in actually what, what traditional black African American community. So uh, the College of Complexes can celebrate with us in that because you helped me bring that argument forward. Uh, but I want to sort of touch on these things about the economy. And it relates back to my work uh, with the social, with Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. Uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know if, if you are aware that uh, the, you know, the car, the car companies are closing plants again. Uh, yeah. Yes, the reason they're closing is because there are not as many people who are purchasing cars. Not, it's not the economy being weak, it's the fact that in people's minds, you know, what, how many teenagers do you know of that have a driver, driver's license? Who wanted, I, I remember when I was growing up, that was like a, a, a rite of passage. You had to, by the time you were 16, if you could squeeze it through at 15 and a half, you got your learner's permit and you got your, your this and your that, and, and that was a part of, of course I grew up in Detroit. But uh, in, in, in current time, I can't tell you how many kids that I've, yeah, teenagers who I've met who don't, who don't drive, they rather have their parents drop them off or other folks drop them off or whatever, and so, so there's something happening in our society. Also a part of what's happening in our society, which is impacting work as far as, uh, 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 impacting work as, far, as well as the, the economy. We have, there's a lot of effort being put forth talking about STEM. You may have heard of it. You know, we got to get kids into STEM. We got to get Latinx and Black kids into STEM, and they they've got they've got to, cause cause uh, you know technology is is what they're going to have. And then we have, and then we have a bunch of folks who are saying that that we want to usher into the service industries as well. So what's happened is we have a lot of people trained, ready, going into this this part of this of the economy in the STEM area. And then we have a lot of people at the bottom who are going into service areas. What we are not done is in the middle, there are things like trades which are not being carried on. We're gonna, there's something like, I believe three or 400 small or, or mid-size uh, manufacturers 
that are going to go out of business. And they're going out of business because the owners have, the, the owners of these small, like I'm talking about tool and die, those types of things, local economy stuff, because there are not enough people being trained to do it. And, the other, and you add on top of that, that they're the uh, owners of these companies, as they transition, whether they die or whether they retire or whatever, their families are not interested in the business. So what happens is those businesses close down. So we, so there are some, I, I don't know, I don't want to be a, 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 I don't know if it being a, a doomsday or about the economy is, is, is actually uh, the route to go, but I will say this, we have got to be aware that our economy is precarious. Anybody who, it's funny, the most pessimistic people about the American economic system that I've ever met have been people who are masters in business, who have a master's degree in business. Because they know how precarious our society is. They know how at risk things are. And if we don't begin to get a handle on, lo on looking at how we address the social ills, that's the point of social innovation. That's the point of social enterprise. Because if we don't get a handle on these things, there is going, there is an inevitable cliff that we are all going to drop off of, that the economy is going to crash and, and, and burn because of. So there are some assertive things. One of the things that we've done at the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation, we have gotten the county with some reluctance to sign on to developing a, a bond, uh, uh, a granted uh, office or to encourage worker-owned factories. So, so if I own a if I own a tool and die company, and I'm reaching the age of retirement, then you provide the option for the employees to buy, to buy into and own the business because they're interested where no one else and 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 would be. And, and that's something that we want to make happen in Cook County more, is more worker-owned and co-op-owned businesses. But we, we have a real, we have a, I don't, you know, I, I hear what you say about capitalism, I'm going to give you a little pushback there, is that uh, capitalism, if we ever had it here, it would be great. But at this point, we don't have capitalism. Because if we had capitalism, some of these, some of these folks would have gone out of business. Right. We have protective markets that, that are going on. That's why GM is still in business. That's why Lockheed Martin didn't go out of business. That's why uh, 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 when the banks collapsed a few years ago, 12 years ago, a lot more folks needed to be made poor. Because, but yet still, because we have protective markets and protective industries, and, and let me just, and, and, and just reflect on this for a minute. The largest corporations in America today own nothing, nothing. Amazon, uh, it's a platform. You know, Google, it's a platform. All of these folks, that they don't own a thing. They're, they're not, they're, all they do is provide a way for those that are doing stuff, making stuff, to put it up on a platform and get it to the consumer, but they don't, this is a very, very unique time that we're in. America is seeing some things that we have not seen before. I mean, it, it is, it, if you go back 50 years and you think that there, you have a concept of how the economy and society and all that works, it is antiquated. I mean, uh, monopolies don't, don't survive in America. There's not a monopoly that has ever survived in America. That's what? what Mark Zuckerberg is most concerned about. Because Mark Zuckerberg does not want government regulation. The uh, head of Google, uh, Alphabet, does not want government regulations because they know that once the government gets involved, we're going to be talking about de de uh, breaking up the monopolies. So we can talk about this a little more, but it's just, uh, I just wanted to add something to that conversation and say that there's a real concern. That's why we started the commission. Uh, uh, that's why the Commission on, uh, on Innovation was started, to look at these things and realize we have got to have some foresight because if we don't, there's going to be real retribution headed our way. All right. Why don't you just go ahead and gavel us out? Huh? Go ahead and gavel us out. Well, the I got a shot.
Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie didn't know. Charlie. We forgot Charlie. Sorry Just about that, Charlie. Out. I, did, I thought you, you spoke already. Right. Yeah, he's an easy person to forget. No, I'm kidding. I forgot, Charlie. Sorry All about right, that. Uh, let's thank our speaker for coming out. Very well. Good night. Thank you for your... Uh, um, your efforts towards uh, improving the city through your campaign. I'm impressed. I'm sorry you... You didn't, uh, you didn't pursue the office through the electoral process. You would have gotten my vote, and our vote, I'm sure. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual here. I've heard some things like we don't have monopolies here in the United States. Uh, when I go shopping around my house, let's see, I've got a choice of a CVS, a Dunkin' Donuts. There's a... Uh, a Subway, a Walgreens, <laughs> uh, a GameStop. Um, there's nothing but monopolies. And you know, amazingly enough, I hear these candidates, at least on the federal level, often speaking about small businesses, and I'm going, there's no such thing as a small business. Have you got Mitchell's and tap? If you, my friend, think that, oh, we just combat this place. I'm going to get the car. Uh, yeah. These multinational corporations, through some legislation, uh, antitrust legislation, these are multinational corporations operating in probably 100 and some countries. Uh, yeah, more employees than this city does, probably. Uh, extended nuclear and extended. Uh, and you're going to say, and the unions are going to organize against them. That's right, yeah. Uh, come on, this is a, you know, a realistic picture. And you've got to have a realistic concept of the world. And the other thing is, you were talking about how wonderful it was that I get these things shipped. Probably the worst jobs in the United States right now are working in these wholesale shipping warehouses. These are the ones where you wear the badges, and if you don't deliver a parcel uh, or package every 30 seconds or so, you get zapped. Or, or sing. Uh, and I've heard that people will work in these places only for, they anticipate, maybe six months. And they say that's about as much as I can take after that. You know, I have to get out of there. So no one takes that as an ongoing position. That's where your capitalism is headed. Wonderful jobs like that. They brought that into the United States, by the way. That's not on, that's not in Asia, Tim. That's in the USA. That's mm -hmm. right here. Maybe in your neighborhood out there by Algonquin. Maybe you got one of them warehouse distribution centers, right? What you you pass it every day perhaps, you know? Didn't know what was going on. Now here's the thing, I wanna to talk to you folks here. I heard a little bit here about this your advocates of these police you want to have civilian monitoring of employees. And I've got to tell you, this is not, this is, this is a, this is, this is not as simple as you think. There's, you think a solution, oh my world is going to be wonderful because you have a, a civilian school board. Or we have a civilians in charge of public transit transit agencies, transit boards. These are boards of people who have no, no knowledge, no knowledge whatsoever of transportation. Absolutely none. They get appointments for partisan political reasons and who knows what. Well-intentioned people. Once in a while you find someone who has some genuine interest in it. We were, we were amusing ourselves the other day. One of these civilian boards, somebody Got, and they couldn't find any relevance or skill that he had in his background towards the board he was serving at for the appointment. There was no connection whatsoever. Okay. It just was rewarding him. It's 8.45, we got to cut it off, Charlie. All right, the last one is, uh, no, uh, 
The other thing you're going to run into with your civilian boards are uh, there happens to be union contracts. There's a thing called labor laws in the United States. And are you going to have civilians in the federal government? Matter of fact, even I know about how the police operate their discipline, internal investigations, not civilians who get together once a month. And even the feds don't do anything like that. Our civil, civil Servants Commission is comprised of veteran federal employees. And there are internal investigations, inspector general offices, who are full-time prosecutorial people, not people who show up once a month. That's, that's the laden with, that's not going to work. Okay. Okay. It's not going to work. Thank you very much. All right, adjourn us out, Charlie. All right. Uh, he wants to say, look. That's it. Uh, we're adjourned for the night. We'll see you all.